yeah so the agenda for this uh, meeting is like uh, uh, i'm going to explain the design for uh, uh, how we are trying to kubernetes c store so we will explain what exactly is kubernetes and c store and uh, how exactly we are trying to perform that and it's more like a design doc explanation more in a simplified way so that even a, a, a non i mean non kubernetes person or person from different domain can understand it better so this is something specific to replica side this is some internals so yeah before that let us know what exactly is kubernetes so it's like a container orchestration system so you have like a cluster running up and you want to do a lot of operations like you need to deploy your applications you need to attach disk so you need to scale it for high availability so you have to do a lot of stuff so you need to orchestrate that one so it's like a container orchestration system so you have like a multiple docker containers to orchestrate that with a, a software called kubernetes it was originally developed uh, started uh, initially developed by google and it has become a open source and uh, we are contributors and of course we are partners as open apis so so the terminologies so it's a kubernetes is like a broad uh, concept so we are making use of a, a single concept called uh, resources so it's also called custom resource definition so we can say like uh, it's an endpoint in kubernetes api so endpoint is like you have the kubernetes exposes a lot of apis so one such api is custom resource definition and uh, it's slightly confusing so here when i show it in a doc so you can have a good analogy explained here like you can imagine a class a c++ class class cid and it has a lot of attributes so and i'm going to have a object cid cr1 cr2 so this cid is custom resource definition cr is custom resource so it's going to have your values test pool c store pool like that so this is a good analogy it seems so i think now we can understand it right so this class and object kubernetes is going to expose and uh, any partner like openebs we can write our own software plug into kubernetes and uh, uh, sell it yes so there are two terminology i mean the topic is about kubernetizing c store right so c store is something very specific to openebs so it's like a new storage engine and uh, that makes use of cow based uh, uh, technique so cow in the sense it's copy on write so it's like storage engine uh, which we are trying to support and it makes use of uh, zfs in the back end so we have two other terminologies that's called c store pool and c store volume replica so c store pool you can say like a, it's like a top lay, top layer on a zfs file system so we call it z pool I mean, open source people call it Z pool, and we make some changes there. We customize it, and we call it C store pool. And the layer above the pool is called a volume. It's a Z wall or something like that. So we call it C store volume like replica. We customize it for our own purpose. So just like this, if this is a pool, these are like volumes. So a pool can have any number of volumes. So right now we have designed like. Uh, a pod can have like one pool so pod is a kubernetes concept so it's uh, it contains i mean it's uh, uh, it contains any number of docker containers yes so we'll go to the high level uh, design so kubernetes has two components like master and minions minions are nothing but nodes uh, a, a system a, a computer or node you can whatever you can call so how we are going to design it so that our uh, application our uh, uh, software is reaching the end user so end user he will apply a yaml file so he will get a crd and this crd is 
watched by Maya. So Maya will get some events either by watcher or any other storage class mechanism. So Maya will get the storage pool claim spec. So it will check if the if the type of storage engine is C store or some legacy storage engine like Jiva. So C store is something which we are developing right now. Mm -hmm. So and I am working on integrating that with uh, Kubernetes. So Maya will create some other uh, CRDs like C store pool, C store volume replica CRD, just we have seen before. And my application will be watching the CRDs, watching the spec of these custom resources, and it will perform some operations on the disk. That is the task. And how we are trying to do it, how we have uh, designed it, is what uh, I'm trying to explain now. Yes. So, yes. So, this is like with the end user. Right now, we can restrict to like from Maya to my application. So this is number one, Maya creates it. Number two is the custom resource. Number three is my application, which watches and performs some operations on the disk. So first of all, why we need to go with this kind of design, you can explain it. So the uh, mark here, it explains better. So we have like a multiple nodes and if one node is not running, so how can we make sure like, uh, so this guy, Maya doesn't know if this node is up or not. So someone need to push that. Someone need to give an event so that whenever this node is going to be up and running, we have to perform that operation. We cannot uh, ping it continuously. That's a improper design. So that is the reason we have uh, selected uh, custom resources. So I'll explain it further. So whenever the node is up, so Kubernetes cluster is going to have one object. And that object is called custom resource. When the node is up, uh, Kubernetes sends the event regarding that object to this application, C store pool management application, and we'll take care of it. So this may not be possible with other approaches, which makes use of uh, REST or gRPC. Uh, whenever the I'm just trying to show in a pictorial way. So the node is up now, it's now healthy. And now my container has started and it's getting the events. So what are the design patterns we have followed? It's a sidecar pattern. So here we have two containers, right? This is a container, C store pool and management is another container. So management is something that interacts with Kubernetes so it's a sidecar we call it it's just a name so sidecar is a pattern name design pattern name so how it is properly defined is like you have two containers main container and sidecar main container is your business logic sidecar is something like uh, uh, some additional stuff the leaves of a stem you can take so uh, and the communication is via some shared disk and it may also be ambassador pattern by Kubernetes concept because both the containers are going to share a same network IP within a pod. Yes, now it's a pod level design. So do you have any questions here? Anyone is having any doubt? Okay. So everyone is comfortable, it seems. So I'll explain the pod level design. So this is a pod. So it's going to have two containers. So this runs a zeropel that is something specific to C store. So this is what we care now in the design. So it, it contains two other binaries, zpool, zfs. So which will uh, create pools and volumes by fork exec. So these CRs, these are objects which are created by Maya. We watch it. So this controllers will watch it and perform zpool ZFS operations. So this guy will get to know about it via a shared volume inside a pod. And we are using Cobra for CLI and these controllers, it's a custom resource controller and the API is offered by Kubernetes.
Yes. So how we are starting the controller is here. We are building it from config, and uh, we are making sure the Z repel. This guy, this this guy is isolated actually from the sidecar container. So we have to make sure the Z repel is running fine, and we have to make sure. Kubernetes understands our terminology since we are one of the partners of Kubernetes. So this is like need to make sure Kubernetes understands our terminologies for that purpose. So we are making a loop and we are going to start two controllers. Yes, C store pool controller. So we get two, three kinds of events from Kubernetes. One is added updated event. When Maya creates an object, we'll get added event. When Maya tries to edit that object, we'll get updated. When it is deleted, the corresponding event. So uh, normally the controller design in Kubernetes or in other community, so they will handle only two stuffs. Like we'll get three events, and finally in the business logic, they'll handle like whether it is present or not. But we have modified it. We have modified the controllers altogether. We are going to offer three uh, events, three business logic, which we'll explain here. So it's not present or not present. It's like we are going to handle add, modify, destroy. So why I have modified here is like here. Uh, um, yeah, so I'll explain it here. Here, ignoring deleted event. So we get updated event for both update and delete because we don't want the object to be deleted when uh, when you try to delete it. It is my application which should control the deletion of the object. Even though user tries to delete it or Maya tries to delete it, my application should be the controller. So you cannot delete it. For that purpose, we are doing something called uh, uh, finalizers. That's also a Kubernetes concept and uh, we handle it here. Yes, and this is for rate limiting work queue. Because we can, you can, it can be explained in a very simple terms, like uh, you have a system running and if you're going to send multiple requests, then it's kind of a denial of service, right? So you can't uh, force the cluster, sorry, you can't force the pod or a system to do multiple tasks, so you need to limit it so uh, so that only one request gets serviced at one point of time, and that task is managed by a rate limiting work queue. When you get multiple requests, the first come, uh, I mean, like a first come first serve. The first guy gets service first; rest of them will wait. So, when the first guy comes, we have to make sure we are getting three events. Oh. Yes. Uh, Ganesh, can you explain why we need to limit like that? Um, yes, it's like uh, when multiple requests come, when uh, when Maya or someone is going to create multiple CRs, so we can't uh, force our uh, uh, application or the resource or the system to perform uh, the task simultaneously. It's going to consume your RAM, your CPU resource, so it's going to consume your disk, everything, right? So we need to restrict it. We need to control it so that only one person gets serviced at one point of time. Rest of them will be waiting in a queue. Um, trying to just understand if uh, it also can help us with uh, out of order events processing. For example, like if I, if the user performs a delete and uh, I mean add and delete yes um, because it's an automated way uh, using GitOps that they create applications and for okay. some reason um, create will come and then immediately a delete will come because something went wrong and okay. um, if the request for delete comes first to the CRD and then the addition no that um, won't happen Mm -hmm. that, is that because we are limiting the queue? No, Kubernetes uh, uh, events are like it's stable enough. Like uh, if you uh, create and delete within a fraction of a second, it is capable of handling the events. It will only send the create event first and then the delete event. So we are making sure like the next guy gets serviced only uh, only when the first guy 
service is over that is how we have designed so even if it is like within uh, some fraction of second uh, uh, interval we are getting added then deleted we are the program is capable of handling it okay yes so make sure of i mean please note this uh, c store id we'll explain it later so why we need it and uh, how we are doing it is like we are going to watch it so these objects are going to be watched by my application and uh, uh, whenever a ch change is going to happen on this object the application will get the event and will perform the operations corresponding business logic operations yes here these are this is the business logic we are when you get an add event if it is already there if the pool is already there we try to import it or we also do some parallel stuff like uh, if it is not there then create it like that and we have to update the same so update the same object over here so what we are going to update is like we are going to update a status whether it's successful or not whether the pool is up and running or it's a failure similarly for delete pool delete pool so this is the controller even though you try to control it you cannot delete it even so uh, it's uh, my application is going to control and that controller is being handled here remove finalizer and the next concept is volume replica volume replica is just we have given an in intro before so it's a layer on top of pool so a pool can have any number of volume replicas and your application only makes use of this volume replica and you do a pvc pv claims internally so there can be these are the objects any number of volume replica objects this is the same stuff what we have explained before and this is our business logic so we check if it is valid we check if the pool is present and we check if it is already imported else we just create it similarly we are doing a destroy event as of now we are not handling any modify event as this is an initial phase of design we'll handle it in next phase yes do you have any doubt okay well proceed just, just one yes um, uh, is there any uh, early integration with ndm plan as part of the scope for example uh, are, there, are there any resiliency cases uh, such as loss of actual, actual resource on which the test of code is created so uh, are we factoring in any of those kind of cases as well yes ndm we have plans to integrate with the, integrate this with ndm uh, that's like a overall uh, high level very high level design so right now we have restricted that to a, a low level and uh, implementation stuff and how we are trying to solve uh, the ndm is definitely going to be integrated so the reason is like so we create pool on top of disks right so okay. how can we know about disks so maya should be having some mechanism to understand which disk is free which disk is available so we can provide it to uh, for use so how will maya be knowing it maya will have some kind of communication maybe with crd with ndm so ndm has like uh, automatic discovery mechanism so whenever you attach a disk so our ndm software open ebs ndm software is capable of uh, getting that event and it's capable of handling like uh, which disk is free and uh, it will send some notification to maya saying like these many disks are free you can make use of it and maya will provision that to my application that is c store pool management container and we'll make pool on top of it and provide it to the end user that's like a very high level approach is it okay yeah yes so we have seen like multiple nodes multiple containers right? so how we are trying to identify the container so we do at the same time you have to make sure we should not confuse the user so the way is like we'll have the custom resources specified with uid and a name so name is like something which the user tries to give it can be like test pool something like that 
So UID is what we try, we'll try to use. So we'll try to avoid class inside uh, our design. So we are going to make use of Kubernetes UID that will have like a more consistent uh, UID compared to our own UIDs. So it's going to be unique for every resource inside a Kubernetes cluster. So we'll have one GYD1 for this container, GYD2 for this container, and uh, we make sure like these are unique and we'll perform the corresponding operations. Yes. So how can end user verify it? See, it's like a very big pipeline. We have NDM first, then we have like one more CRD, then Maya, then one more CRD. We have our application is at the last. So how can the end user verify it? Since it's a CRD, so, uh, we don't need to confuse user with any API or something. Can do can just do a kubectl get c store pool. That's it. That's a kubectl command. Or he, since he claims a storage pool claim, he can verify it with the kubectl get storage pool. This is the uh, outcome created by Maya. It's very simple. So you don't need to confuse him with multiple commands or own CLIs. So very particular, he's very interested in finding a status of a particular pool. He can just do a kubectl get c store pool or pool name. This can be a test pool, whatever he has created. Very simple. And uh, it'll be like this status in it online, offline, like that. Yes. How do you perform testing? So testing is like uh, we are doing two kinds of testing right now in my level and there will be one, one more testing called end to end test. So testing we are doing like uh, in a testing it's like a function level testing. It's like more related to our code. You can have like 10 functions and you can have like 10 corresponding unit tests. So it's no way related to the business logic and uh, this should be the condition is like uh, this should run on any environment and uh, it should not uh, depend on any third party stuff. This is a definition for unit testing and we are, uh, we are trying to do it. And integration testing is like, it's more related to functionality. See, we are creating and deleting pool now and we have to make sure that this happens at least in one environment. And end-to-end -end testing, this will integrate with everything from end user to Maya till my uh, pool management containers that's it and this is some some generic stuff and it's related to us also so how do you synchronize microservices so kubernetes came up to synchronize so it's for orchestration or you can call it like a synchronize so maya and kubernetes they synchronize at application level like whenever my node is whenever my application is not there in case of a node failure Kubernetes make sure that uh, my my uh, application comes up comes up whenever the node is running. So that is at application level or at Kubernetes pod level. Next one is inside the container. So we have like uh, inside a pod we have like two containers running. And how do we make sure that one guy is up before the second guy? So that we are handling with a life cycle. Life cycle is like we are just giving some uh, delay. So that the first guy is uh, up and running before the second person because they are completely isolated. And uh, other synchronization mechanisms are blocking loop statement. So we need to block like this. You can have a sleep and block. That's very common. And uh, next one is like uh, go routines paid group concept. This is like concurrent programming. So you have like multiple threads running and you need to make sure every every thread is synchronized properly with the main thread. So every, every guy should return to the main thread properly and uh, it should not terminate. One guy should not terminate before the other and that stuff are handled by go routines, wait groups, channels and we are doing entire Kubernetes, sorry, Golang uh, concurrent programming. Yes, so this is like some package definition what we are trying to do. So how we are trying to do is like we'll just define the uh, struct uh, variable and we'll generate a corresponding code. So you don't need to write code here, just need to generate, right? run a script, 
it will generate a part of code and you will write your business logic over here that's very simple so and i have set up the ci cd pipeline also for uh, our application and it's available under open ebs maya so that's it so contributors are welcome to uh, open ebs so we can contribute to our own project so if we are going to learn the controllers and all that's a bit uh, advanced so you're going to become a, a contributor to i mean you can become a contributor to kubernetes because this is the same which kubernetes uses so kubernetes is going to be like managed by google and uh, so please follow and support us and here we have the links so we, these are twitter ids and thank you uh ganesh just one question uh, yes. maybe you already you already covered it so this is to pool management containers themselves how are we managing that uh, how are we ensuring that they are always available how are we deploying them yes so yeah it's a good question so how are they available is like uh, we are using a deployment right now we may use a daemon set so deployment make sure deployment is a kubernetes concept so uh, it's a like whenever uh, you try you, you specify the number of replicas you want in deployment or you can have it like maya will make sure like uh, the deployment is ready so maya will uh, create the deployment for our uh, uh, management and uh, it will make sure it will give the necessary inputs via custom resources okay yeah i think it's also related to how do we make sure that this pod doesn't get evicted uh, right due to resource crunch um, so the deployment yaml should have um, uh, the attributes to say it is pinned to that particular node and also yes. um, the priority for this particular deployment should be higher to compared to the others since uh, we are doing let's, uh, let's include that uh, aspect into the um, as a question or like as a way to ensure that you know, it should be covered in the test as well okay okay Yes. Do we have any other questions? Yes. I think we are good to go, Kiran. We can start the next presentation. Thank you, guys. This was the project. Um, we made announcements around it, and there are like sample test, couple of sample tests that are covered right now. Um, so. just want to bring it up here and brainstorm on what are the next steps with respect to uh, litmus uh, amit had some ideas around um, you know how we want to take it forward just want to hear those thoughts and any other thoughts from the community to uh, see how to plan the next steps around that yeah hey hi kiran uh, hi everyone uh, so uh, Uh, with regards to uh, litmus so so litmus uh, is going to be our uh, e2e uh, solution you call it a suit and uh, or uh, and uh, <clears throat> more than uh, our e2e we, we uh, emphasize our litmus uh, giving the capability to the users enabling the users the end users of open ebs to contribute uh, Uh, or to use litmus as a uh, library uh, to build their own uh, testing or test cases um okay so before i actually start uh, um uh, can i know like if all of us are aware of like how litmus works uh, has anybody tried to uh, watch the video that we had at kubecon or maybe any one of you have actually tried it hands on um like 
you 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 can actually uh, i mean i just want to listen like uh, what are if you have done anything uh, with regards to that what are your feelings uh, what do you think are missing or something at least uh, any one of you have gone through the video uh, <clears throat> Uh, otherwise, like uh, explaining a bit because I don't have a slide deck and explaining. Uh, mm, I've just written down some of the statements, uh, but then explaining explaining that will be a little bit difficult. Uh, so I wanted to know, like, from the audience, uh, uh, if we are aware of what litmus is, how it works, uh, anything. Yeah, I think uh, I mean, so uh, um, there were a couple of. Uh, Discussions that we had within uh, the team, the OPBS E2E team, and okay. had an opportunity to talk to Sudarshan about uh, Litmel. And uh, yeah, so there were some thoughts that he had about how he can contribute into the Litmel, the team can contribute into Litmel. Yeah, the overall uh, feeling or the uh, thought process was to write tests that are not specific to any storage solution in particular and are generic tests for straight to the clothes. And uh, yeah, so I think that message has uh, been communicated. Okay. Um, and I, I okay. guess, yeah, we, I think the team has come up with, I think, across with the video as well. Okay. So, um, mm, all right, so I'm not uh, seeing any. Uh, uh, I I just feel that uh, some of us have gone through the video, at least how it works, and maybe probably most of us have not gone through the video. Um, I'll just uh, uh, I mean request all to have a look at the video at least. Uh, maybe uh, it, it will be really good if they can do a hands-on. Uh, they can uh, try to get clone the litmus and uh, try out one of the test cases. Um, I, uh, so in this talk, I will just uh, uh, try to um, detail out some of the things I have in my mind uh, where litmus can go. And this is uh, uh, not about um, users in general, how uh, um, uh, the user stories, uh, what kind of user stories, what kind of test cases. Uh, we should include. It's more about how we uh, build the Litmus. It's a Litmus, the core of the Litmus. So currently, uh, Litmus uses GoDog as its, you may say it as its front end. Uh, end users can start writing user stories and the user stories are uh, understood by Litmus uh, because uh, it's a wrapper over GoDog. It understands GoDog. Uh, GoDog translates each of these statements into a go function, all right? Uh, in the go function, uh, one writes the code, that is literally the go programming syntaxes um, uh, to execute that particular user story statement. And this go uh, syntaxes uh, are nothing but a wrapper over kubectl commands, all right? Um, if we look from the packaging point of view, we package um, a test case as a Docker image that can be run as in, in the Kubernetes. Uh, it uses Kubernetes job resource, okay? So Kubernetes, uh, this particular Kubernetes job uh, is provided uh, with specific uh, access. That means some RBAC rules are provided so that it can execute some of the kubectl operations. A test case may involve creating, deleting, and you know accessing uh, certain resources, Kubernetes resources from various namespaces, right? Uh, so th that means the job which is running this test case should have those access, right? Uh, so this was all about packaging the access and how uh, Litmus tries to uh, convert a particular uh, uh, use case to a uh, go method, all right? Just uh, for the benefit of the audience, I'll just show the a use case. This is a test case, okay? And this is the use case, right? Each of these statements, uh, each of these English lines, okay, is mapped to a go method. 
and uh, we'll look at the go method okay so these are the statements it is mapped to a particular go method which is all present in this file itself and this file does a cube cuttle operation it's as simple as that all right uh, but then there are cases where it, it cannot be really simple a particular statement uh, can involve uh, a lot of code it can involve uh, bringing up a uh, an application or before bringing up the application uh, maybe installing uh, some of the operators some of the custom resources uh, testing the application without custom resource or uh, testing the application after installing of custom resource there can be like multitude of cases right and um, the the code grows and uh, um, so uh, we are back to the same state uh, like we have to like devote a lot of time to code and uh, to make it uh, worthy of a test case right <clears throat> so what i have been looking out of from various uh, Mm, uh, you know, uh, libraries. Uh, some of them are related to testing libraries, and and some of them are not um, related to testing. Um, uh, so what, what they do is um, they are to simplify these things, to simplify um, or to enable end users to participate in the library. What they do is they uh, they decouple these functions, these codes. Uh, from uh, uh, the let's say in our case from the user stories it will be like uh, moving out these functions to some other place uh, and the user stories will remain same litmus will be mapping uh, these functions to the user stories when the user stories get executed uh, now what happens is uh, these functions are no longer uh, the go functions or let's say any programming language functions uh, rather these functions uh, are become a kind of a uh, we are like quite familiar with yaml or specifications these functions are uh, converting into uh, specifications okay these specifications are in turn regarded as a payload to a http service okay to an external service right so the external service in our particular case if if we think about litmus it will be for example a litmus http service okay the functions have now got converted into some specifications for example yaml or json this json will be uh, pushed to the or will be you know um, passed on to the litmus http service and litmus http service is the one which understands this payload this json which is nothing but a function uh, does the operations uh, based on the values present in the json and comes back all right <clears throat> uh, what i have just mentioned now is otherwise known as lambda functions lambda expressions these are also known as webhooks in uh, kubernetes uh, this is not to be confused or, or this is not exactly the uh, okay, so webhooks. Uh, as far as I remember, webhooks I have heard uh, from the GitHub days where this uh, this, this kind of functionality is via webhook. Uh, Kubernetes has also taken it forward where um, it expects uh, operators or admins to write webhooks, and uh, Kubernetes understands them and will uh, do stuff uh, as written in the webhooks. All right. Uh, it's basically a function you package a function as a yaml file or uh, as a json file uh, pass it to some http service this http service is a webhook service and it will do the job for you uh, right so um, with this in mind uh, uh, first we started with you know this uh, code the programming things and then we are moving to let's say yaml um, and then we think that okay, if it is a YAML, it should be a properly defined payload. The payload has to be accepted by some HTTP service. We assume it will be a, like a Litmus HTTP service, and Litmus HTTP service in turn will call the kubectl commands. All right. Uh, with with all these things, uh, what all comes to our mind is YAML, which which can actually grow on. It's 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 difficult to build a YAML, which is a subset of a programming language. All right, it is difficult. Uh, that is one thing. Uh, second thing is uh, 
uh, the the litmus uh, is no longer a simple uh, binary it, it has to be a http service uh, and if you have yeah, and if you want to really define a http service you again go back to the swagger open api specs which uh, uh, because this is uh, the, this is currently the way where how the http services are defined and implemented right um, and so on so uh, the, the complexity uh, rises right um, now now let's say uh, <clears throat> uh, we so for example i assume that uh, this is um, the yaml part is uh, worth it uh, but then can we uh, decrease the complexity which is now increasing because of these webhooks and all those stuff all those uh, things right um, this leads to me leads me to another feature from kubernetes uh, which is very similar to what we talked about like functions and http services uh, how about uh, custom resources right uh, if you see custom resources custom resource right it, it has a definition crd which is maybe i can assume it to be a kind of a registration uh, kind of a swagger uh, spec okay and the custom resource itself can be assumed to be that function which is written as a yaml all right um, and the http service I, I can assume the C, the custom resource operator as the http service uh, and of course um, the operator way is no longer uh, i mean it doesn't have the ability now to have um, our own way of specifying the endpoints but still, I guess uh, whatever hooks it has, the Kubernetes operator hooks, for example, on add, uh, on delete, and on uh, update, these three hooks, I guess this is sufficient uh, for the litmus use cases. And uh, uh, with the CR, we, we really don't need to bother about Swagger. Uh, CR is coming up with its own uh, validations, which is, again, a, I, I don't know if it's an extension or... It's the same as the open API validation uh, uh, format. It, it is, it has come out with sub resources. Uh, sub resources uh, can be thought of as a CR within a CR. Uh, we typically specify some of the properties, right? Along with that property, we can also specify something called as status. Uh, status will have like, let's say reason, the failure reason, timestamps and so on. So these are effectively known as sub resources. Another kind of sub resources uh, is like scaling up. You want to scale up your custom resources from one instance to multiple instances. But then, uh, uh, but then the scaling up sub resource, uh, I have not tried to fit it into Litmus. I don't know if it it will fit or not. But status is one sub resource where I see Litmus can benefit. All right. Now, if we, if we, if we try to, uh, you know, if I try to. Yeah, 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 uh, Karthik. Yeah, yeah, just a question before we go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I'm just trying to understand the premise for uh, doing this. So it was mm -hmm. as an HTTP service itself. Uh, yeah. Potentially, I just wanted to sort of understand and also for the benefit of the others. Why would that be helpful for us or needed as against what is already present where the user is defining an English scenario and we are converting it into Google? Okay. Uh, okay. Great question. Uh, if we move on to a HTTP service uh, with uh, that understands functions and the functions are, uh, you know, YAMLs or JSONs, we don't need to write these uh, specific code. All right. Mm -hmm. Instead, it will be very similar to, uh, I know you have been looking into the chaos, uh, AWS chaos kit where you see those, uh, uh, you know, YAMLs where it is written like, uh, uh, let me see, uh, um, those YAMLs which, uh, which says like, uh, um, run these and, uh, and expect it to be a pass or expect it to be a fail or expect the output to have this thing, right? Um, right. So it's more about not getting uh, into the coding aspects uh, but about uh, creating the YAML and uh, I, I guess maybe YAML is a little bit easy or YAML or JSON way of specifying is a bit easier way than uh, writing uh, the, uh, the entire code or something. 
Okay. That, that was like uh, my thing. Again, I have not done a um, lot of research, uh, and uh, I'm just not. Uh, this is not. This is just an opinion that I felt, uh, and I, I see like almost everyone is going in a similar way where they're not expecting users or you know even the scripters to write code. Rather, uh, um, rather uh, put some values in a in a predefined YAML. Okay. Um. Okay, so um, yeah, I forgot what I was talking about. Um, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, um, so so finally, yeah, so like I explained uh, to Karthik, this is what uh, I felt that will be a dot feature file, which will be a pure uh, user story. All right, and uh, in this, uh, that will be a dot go file. I agree. Um, but here, uh, when there is a mapping, the mapping will indirectly invoke that HTTP service. That URI uh, will be uh, mentioned here. Okay, and each of the functions will be, a, you know, a .yaml file. Okay, so each function implies each statement. So each of these statement, okay, will be represented as a YAML. And that YAML is nothing but, you know, the, that. Uh, that can be passed by the litmus service um, and that is actually the code okay it is it has the ability to uh, do some kubectl uh, applies get some kubectl stuff and um, get those verifications um, i know i have not been uh, that much clear because i don't have a presentation ready um, uh, but this was like uh, what i have been uh, thinking about um, yeah so maybe uh, all of you can uh, put put your own uh, stories your own uh, viewpoints yeah thanks Amit. i think uh, uh, yeah i think it's a good way to uh, think uh, go ahead with uh, how we can build it with just uh, just a point uh, i also wanted to put in just some uh, thoughts we can uh, spend time on is um, uh, so as I contributed, uh, one of the things missing, I think, from the existing test, which is very apparent, is the fact that uh, there is no exact status mechanism for us to know whether a test has passed or failed, or there is no uh, exact uh, output file or things like that. Uh, probably one way of getting that would be helpful, number one. And number two is uh, the reason for what failed um, the test. Um, a way, yeah. good way to articulate that. In one of the conversations with the user, um, mm -hmm. I got this feedback that uh, one of the goals of Fitness would be if uh, we can ultimately give the job to a developer, then um, a developer yes. can run it in his environment and uh, tell us whether it is working or no, and if it's not working, what went wrong. So probably yeah, yeah. some thoughts there. Okay. Yes. Uh, so I'm just taking uh, the feedback from both you and uh, Karthik. Um, uh, just you know, trying to put out one uh, scenario where we can do this, right? So let's say we we still want the users or like the uh, again like you know we have to be clear on the personas that we have. Uh, so one of the personas is somebody who is clear about what they want the workload to do, and um, the responsibility of the litmus is while whatever the workload is supposed to do is happening. Um, we release uh, chaos into the cluster and will yeah. ensure that um, the workload is working fine, right? Right. Um, so if I look at the E2E feature today, uh, mm -hmm. it defines uh, the workload behavior. Right. Um, and into this workload, somehow we are injecting probably the um, uh, chaos related stuff um, as statements right yes uh, so um, just wondering if those should be separated out uh, for example uh, customer just wants the application to run like um, i want i want to serve 1000 requests per uh, second is my requirement and uh, the chaos could be like you know the node where it is running is overloaded um, mm. 
uh, or like the node that uh, where it's running is uh, uh, down uh, yes. those are all uh, negative conditions uh, that come in uh, but the expected behavior doesn't change right true uh, yeah. uh, so should you know maybe like the c2e feature does it uh, i i keep seeing this given when then and right Mm -hmm. are are these um, keywords of godog or are these something that we have made up mm. uh, so i have just uh, tried to follow the uh, godog i have not um, i just i believe maybe the first words will be eliminated uh, <laughs> uh, the the uh, i i believe that the first words will be eliminated uh, and we can have anything as our first word Uh, but i have not tried it out uh, so i just uh, tried out whatever i saw as examples in godog uh, that is like one thing and the second thing about uh, like chaos monkey uh, i uh, i also believe that uh, like the this feature uh, the user story should not have chaos monkey uh, injected as one of the statements rather the chaos monkey should be run as a a separate uh, uh, user story or something separate it will be running and while it is running on the environment we push this uh user story and see if the user story is valid uh is what i thought right um and i think the uh, we also are right now defining a something called as a run litmus dot yaml file which is a kubernetes job that packages the code of and uh, that tests and then executes yeah. it um yes. so hearing your earlier thoughts um Mm, can we extend that to say that you know we will have um, instead of like a kubernetes job or something we will have mm -hmm. um, let's say a kind called the litmus test right and okay. uh, um, that will basically describe how this test has to be run um, um yes. and that particular um test has um basically a spec which is mostly about like what the test has to do and then a status yeah. field uh, tying in what uh, kartik is saying uh, exactly that could be as simple as uh, pass fail were and um, you know could could actually the result structure could be as um, uh, extensible as it can be for example like sometimes we want to uh, take up like performance related numbers and all that right yeah so we can have that as kind of a you know sub resource yeah i i mean i agree with you uh, kiran and and also kartik whatever he's feeding in um yeah we can uh, i mean these are possible yes okay uh, so the probably the part that's not uh, clear to me is how do we um, uh, you know the, the the spec part um mm -hmm. the, the results is clear because we have been dealing with that Um, right, right. Yeah. Converting this um, uh, English text into the spec in a generic way mm, mm -hmm. sounds like we need to do good amount of work. That uh, maybe like we can tie in this concept of uh, meta controllers there with function as a services. Or um, mm. uh, that that part is still vague. Maybe um, mm, so we have a design document for this one. um and it just defines right now a very high level um if you could just open that maybe if you go to the litmus uh, page right okay uh, go to the pull request yeah yeah okay <clears throat> so uh, within this one right on that link sorry for that <clears throat> directions but yeah oh uh, uh, yeah Yes. So, so this, this is, uh, you know, it actually details the current design uh, with which we have, um, uh, you know, the repo is it been implemented, um, and if you click on that uh, high level design test section, right? Can you? Yeah. Yeah. So this one currently goes with the flow of. Uh, um, you know what we have implemented but i think mm -hmm. if we can update whatever we discussed just now mm -hmm. and uh, work on uh, uh, clarifying that flow from e to e mm -hmm. feature how if you go down uh, so mm -hmm. what uh, what we have done is it 
basically explains that that statements will be converted into code like this and that code yeah. will be implemented yeah. by this code right, right. and right. Be, be, so this section needs to be updated right mm -hmm. um, so i can capture whatever we discussed today into this um, mm -hmm. but i would definitely need more help in terms of uh, uh, contributing to that piece where mm -hmm. uh, how do we actually write that spec that can be yeah yeah so uh, yeah i mean this is this was just a thought uh, i mean before uh, getting into uh, that thing i wanted to know like um, I wanted to like measure the feelings or uh, uh, <clears throat> are we happy with the current thing? If you're happy, then, uh, you know, this future or the, uh, this uh, custom resource may not be required. Uh, um, I, I wanted to, uh, or all of us can actually brainstorm. Uh, if, if you really think that is, that will help us help uh, mm, the users um uh, definitely I, I can actually start writing about it or maybe we can talk more about it but what what do you feel kiran or, or karthik uh, uh, okay uh, uh, from my um, having played with it right um, mm -hmm. the couple of things that are missing is the way we capture the results uh, that's right. okay. probably the most important thing right now okay. and um, <laughs> the separation of chaos from the functionality itself. Okay. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. Uh, there's no clear. Uh, so chaos seems to be too tied into the uh, functionality. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And I just feel that it should be separated out. We separated. Be able to True. Run any type of chaos tools depending yeah. on the infrastructure where we are. Uh, True. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Kiran. Um, I'm in line with the thought separating chaos from the user story or the text specifically itself. Whatever Amit mentioned where you will already have an E2E feature, you are basically driving it to closure and you expect the E2E to pass. That is what we are specifying in the uh, E2E dot feature. So what is intended in the E2E dot feature? For that to be executed, we are going to put some impediments in terms of chaos, which is defined separately. But still, the ETE features requirement should be met, or it should go through. The test should pass. That is a good way of uh, thinking about how to use the chaos along with the test. Probably, it is also in line with the general chaos uh, engineering community's thought. Um, so, from what I spoke with Sylvain and the others earlier, was different uh, chaos engineering as a principle is. Um, is separate from a test or an E2E. It is something that you inject on any process. The process could be a test or it could be something running in production, but the end result should be as desired. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think the taking that further, right, we have test and test executor as two core concepts um, mm -hmm. today. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably we need it, uh, you know, we need to split the test into two aspects. One is just the test and then um, a chaos. I, you know, I'm visualizing more of this as like a three edges of a triangle. Mm -hmm. um, each are dependent on the other, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they are kind of independent as well. Um, so a test is describing what a uh, workload has to do. And the behavior of that changes depending on the environment you are in. Uh, you know, some environments are better suited and uh, some may not. And that's the whole purpose of litmus to tell which environment suits <coughs> that workload better. And then right. depending on the environment where we are running, uh, the chaos that can be introduced in the environment is a separate thing, right? Um, uh, chaos really depends on, let's say I have an, um, um, AWS environment, then I could probably use the AWS Chaos Monkey, right? Um, right. For using the Chaos. Um, and if I'm, so that's one Chaos that I can release. On mm -hmm. top of that, let's say, okay, now you're running Kubernetes. So I can release a Kubernetes Chaos Monkey as well into mm -hmm. it. And now True. let's say, okay, you're using the solution called OpenEBS on top of this stack. So I will release mm -hmm. a OpenEBS Chaos Monkey as well. Right? Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this uh, 
sounds to be like good because it is decoupled and there is no tight coupling uh, yeah there is no one uh, depends on the other and uh, uh, i guess maybe for, from the logs aspects whatever karthik has been saying and users obviously i i just uh, feel that um, we may not be able to you know plumb uh, plug in uh, all those uh, logging stuff into the uh, the outputs and uh, uh, how about like log logging as a separate uh, stuff let's say for that stern and all uh, they uh, we 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 you know uh, give an intent or give a specs to that stern uh, so that the stern is able to uh, log litmus specific pods or, or i don't know so something like that we we give some selector or something and it is able to uh the logs that we get from uh, the stern the container um is well is relevant to the the test case that uh, that was run by litmus yeah i think that is I mean, we can start off with that uh, and see how it goes um yeah so there are two aspects to this talking uh, i am thinking of so one is that what is said uh, giving the test specific ports as an argument to logger to capture them i think currently it is already running that way there is some mm-hmm. regex we can pass to the logger to mm-hmm. like the desired ports second thing and also the range space we can pass etc the other aspect is so once the logs for a test are available if there can be a, a, some way of visualizing um, uh, logs for a particular time stamp across the different logs collected For example, yeah. so this, is, this is part of the uh, debug, the debugging uh, for the failed test. Right, so, right. Yeah. So, so uh, for for example, I mean, I visualize this as let's say a stern logger. Uh, before we launch the litmus job, maybe we will we launch the uh, the logger for that job. Uh, Uh, it, it will be like for every job we have a uh, stern uh, job a stern uh, pod or something or it may be like one uh, stern uh, pod for all the jobs uh, i mean that that is like one way of uh, deployment I, i was thinking of second thing that we were saying is like debugging and all uh, i felt um, we have to write again a kind of a plugin or a bridge uh, which will be able to parse the logs from uh, the stern and put it into something maybe uh, sooner by or, or some other stuff um for a better visualization uh yeah uh, i mean i mean yeah getting into the root cause kind of a thing yeah. Yeah, currently uh, i think it comes with the, the first way you explained that is uh, the logger is instantiated for each test and the name okay. of the of, of the test so mm-hmm. the particular test logs is available in a particular uh, location which bears the test identity uh, we can think about whether we want a consolidated logging thing which keeps running across the entire thing uh, but, mm-hmm. but i think that ties in more to an executor framework kind of thing from the test perspective itself i think the way we are doing it now where it starts and ends with the test is a good way the second one uh, the second aspect of uh, getting the uh, logs of all the uh, individual pods or the individual uh, test chaos containers etc to be able to have a consolidated view of each log for a given time stamp and feeding that into some or visualizing that by writing a plugin etc is mm-hmm. one of the aspects we have to think further about mm-hmm. uh okay uh all right uh okay so so kiran coming back uh, to like what, what are the tasks that we should be focusing on uh, uh, currently uh, so, uh, again we had yesterday that uh, meeting where we thought like after four weeks we'll be uh, presenting a demo maybe we can align our task for that demo mm, yes uh, so the uh, i mean also like based on this discussion right the mm-hmm. big gaps right now are uh, uh, some amount of uh, enhancements around status logging and uh, right. uh, some amount of uh, work i mean basically some work items related to logs right 
right. and um, yeah. these are the two framework related ones and couple of other items are let's get the chaos thing in, in introduced uh, as mm -hmm. a upgrade concept to this feature right right um, uh -huh. And the fourth one is um, we want to at least be able to demonstrate um, open APIs and local PB. Right? Um, okay. So let me see is about um, also trying to compare. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if we can get these four things um, um, done as per like what we also update in the design, mm -hmm. uh, is good for the demo. Um, okay. Uh, that's what I think. What what what, what do you guys feel? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, by the time we give the demo to the student at the work group, um, um, we can put some design which is in line with our demo. Whatever we are going to implement with respect to uh, break the chaos log and all, we can have the same thing in the design. If someone from the work group tries to take a look, um, they will get the same info and uh, it corresponds to what they saw, and then we can continue to enhance it. Correct. Uh, so, I'm also like, you know, our discussions are mostly centered around um, the functionality that we want to add and the design. Amit, mm -hmm. I think you also had thoughts on how to increase the visibility of uh, Litmus. Um, yeah. And uh, some things need to be done around that. Um, to showcase it in a marketing light right yeah so uh right uh yeah i mean um, the first thing starts with the readme and individual test case uh, readme we have to um uh, we uh, it it it, ha it should be terse as well as it should be like uh, i mean uh, people should be able to understand it uh, we we cannot have like really really long uh, uh, readmes or docs Instead, maybe we can try out uh, some of those uh, two minutes, three minutes video that describes that test. Maybe we can uh, tweet about it. We can put it in some folders. Uh, Readme will have one uh, video kind of a stuff. And other test cases, definitely for each test case uh, that we are solving, we can actually blog it out. And in the blog itself, we can have that video or something like that. Um, is what I felt uh, will gain in more. Uh, I mean, users and they can actually. Uh, I mean, give us uh, the 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 real feedback uh, as to where it must be moving. <clears throat> right. So I, I think uh, maybe what I'm hearing is couple of tasks there. Uh, one is uh, making sure we have a, a readme for individual tests so that it's easy to execute, yeah. and creating videos, uh, yeah. and maybe rolling that out in a blog. Right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, so functionality four items we discussed, and um, around two items for the uh, maybe communitizing or socializing this litmus with the external world, right? True, um, true, true. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. Are you thinking about uh, something like a litmus uh, test series, like how, the how do I series? Let's yeah, yeah. Series one, <laughs> two, three. You are right. Yeah, some good uh, <laughs> phrase. Yeah. So because it is a user story, I mean, we can keep on blocking each user story. And Thanks for the patience from the other people who are on the call. Thank you. Uh, we have some chats. Uh, I don't know if it's all. Just uh, one CNCF. Uh, if you write CRD, YAML in Litmus, we get one more CRD watcher. All right, yeah. So the uh, task of updating the design document and creating those uh, tasks. Okay. Um, um, yeah, Karen. So I will also have a uh, final look at the this document and if at all needed, I will uh, put some comments. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone.